Hey everybody, welcome to day two of the campaign class, or lecture two of the campaign class. I guess technically this would be, well, yeah, day two of the class, third day of the term. Today is actually Tuesday uh, on day 19 of my self-quarantine, and uh, I'm going to do things a little differently with this lecture. As you can see, I actually have the diagram on the board. Uh, I've never had a chance to do this before because obviously, Classroom. Somebody's in the classroom beforehand, and I'm not going to come to the classroom half an hour early, uh, even if it is empty, to put the diagram on the board. But I realized as I was preparing for today's uh, lecture that I could just put the diagram on the board. I could do it neatly, and that way I could save time and all the writing and you looking at my back. Uh, and we'll see what it's like. I've never taught like this before with the diagram completely uh, behind me already. If you're listening in on the audio, just know that the board has the diagram, so you can look at the uh, screenshot that is made available to you while you're listening along. Um, for those of you watching on the video, this might be a little small, uh, and just know that there's a high-res version of a photograph of this so you can zoom in and see all of the things. I'm not really sure how easy it's gonna be to see this board uh, as I lecture. But that's the way we're gonna do it. Uh, so there's no reason not to get started. Here we go. Um, today's class is really intended to be an overview of the material that we're going to cover uh, in this class and uh, the entire next nine weeks is going to be dedicated to making what I cover today uh, deeper, uh, both a deeper understanding of the dynamics that go into each of these uh, aspects of a campaign operation as well as deepening your uh, skills at performing those particular kinds of tasks. And the guest lecturers will focus on certain specific skills that we're talking about, uh, uh, that I'm gonna talk about today with the layout in general. Okay, so, moving parts of a campaign operation. The big picture. Uh, what's the goal of a campaign? To win, right? Here it is, winning. And how do you win? Duh, you get the most votes. That's the easy part of what we know we're doing. You're out there trying to get the most votes. Uh, what gets you the most votes? Well, there are two big components to what gets you the most votes. One is turnout of your people. The people who are going to vote for you, probably no matter what, or almost likely, who are either heavily leaning or strongly leaning in your direction. Right? If we're talking about a partisan state legislative race uh, uh, and you're a Democrat, these are your loyal Democrats. These are your, uh, these are your uh, heavily leaning Democrats. People who occasionally maybe vote for a Republican based on a specific character trait or a specific time. But these are your people. Turnout. You need to get as many of your people to the polls as possible, right? Because just because people would vote for you doesn't contribute to getting the most votes. And this is a really important feature of a campaign. Turnout is, in some elections, turnout is everything. Uh, there are definitely ways to win and there are uh, ways to lose that hinge solely on whether your people come in large enough numbers. Uh, <clears throat> and there are certain things that you can't do about turnout. Uh, and this is just one of those uh, exogenous factors in the campaign that you don't have any control over. Uh, if, for example, you're a Democrat and you're running in a year when Democrats are dispirited or uh, they are, uh, there's low energy or the issues that are in front of the country or in front of people don't really speak to them, uh, then it's going to be a harder task to, to energize your Democratic voters. Whereas if you're a Democrat and uh, it's a year where there's a lot of dissatisfaction with a Republican president or with the Republican control over Congress, even if you're running for you know, state legislature, which is maybe democratically controlled anyway, just like it is here in Oregon, and there's a Republican controlled Congress, and the mood of the country is such that people are fed up with uh, the Republicans. You're gonna get more turnout. There's really nothing you can do about that kind of wave-like aspect to, to turnout. Uh, you can benefit from it, or it can create an uphill battle for you, but that's kind of beyond your control. But Within that, and most elections don't necessarily have a wave-like character to them, though in recent decades, wave uh, elections have come more frequently, absolutely. Um, and again, the wave is, uh, can come from a place that doesn't even have to do with what you or your candidate are running for. If you're running for state legislature in Oregon, which has democratically controlled and we have a left-leaning uh, electorate, but the mood of the country is, you know, maybe dis 
dispirited with a democratic congress, you're going to have low turnout, even if people are generally happy with what's going on uh, in Oregon. The same thing is true, or the opposite of the case is true, if there is a Republican Congress and pe people are really, Democrats particularly, are really frustrated with them, they really want to get rid of them. Even though they're not trying to get rid of somebody here in the State House, they're trying to get rid of people in Congress, that's a turnout uh, um, benefit to your campaign. Uh, <clears throat> so, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, sometimes you're going to have the wind in your back, and sometimes you're going to have the wind in your face in terms of turnout, but it's always going to be important to get as many of your people as possible to the polls. Not just people who would vote for you, but people who actually then do vote for you. Uh, the other component, and this also kind of varies in how big of a group this, this is and how uh, important it is, is the swayable or persuadable voters. These are your moderates, your independents, uh, the people who actually make up their mind from uh, election to election uh, based on what the issues are, what they're thinking, what's happening in their lives. Uh, in, in some elections, there's a lot of those people. In other elections, there's very few of them. Uh, and there's been, in recent years, some decent political science work done on how big of a group is this, right? The conventional wisdom in politics is you have to, uh, or at least the conventional wisdom among, I would say, amateurs of, uh, in politics, people who just observe it from the outside, I don't mean to use that in a disparaging way, but people who observe it from the outside, is that these are the voters that matter. This is what a campaign is. A campaign is about persuading people to vote for you, to vote for your candidate, to vote for your ballot measure. Um, and absolutely that's part of it. But there is potentially in the country a shrinking group of these people, and I would say election to election, this group grows larger or smaller, and it really does kind of depend on uh, the office you're running for, the uh, geographic territory, the constituency, but this group matters. Just, it's not the only group that matters. There's really two components to getting the most votes. Getting a lot of your people who are going to vote for your candidate there, right? And if it's a nonpartisan election, your people are actually just people who, you know, who like you, who, uh, you know, not because you're a Democrat or a Republican, but maybe because of your family name, or because you have a position in the community, or because you have uh, some kind of reputation that you've developed either through some sort of celebrity or some sort of community action or through social media. These are the people who are like, oh yeah, I'm all, I'm all for Jack. You just gotta make sure that they actually get to the polls. Um, your persuadable voters, of course, are people who, they don't, either don't know you, or uh, they you know, are on the fence about your issues. Both of these components are extremely important to getting most uh, votes. One of the things you're going to learn to do in a campaign, actually, is identify who these people are, how many of them there are, and where you ought to be putting your resources. And there's no sort of across-the-board rule for whether you're going to focus on turnout or whether you're going to focus on persuasion in equal measures or mostly this or a little bit of that or mostly this what your ratio is, that's going to vary from race to race and it's going to vary from year to year. What's true in uh, you know, Congressional District 3 in 2018 might not be true for Congressional District 3 in 2020 uh, based on exogenous factors like the you know, uh, events, <laughs> we, have a, we have a pandemic and we have a Republican president and we have a Republican Senate and a Democratic House. How are people, how are the bases of both parties responding to this? in district, uh, that's going to affect the energy level of district three. Okay, let me move backwards across here. This is the goal though, right? Winning the most votes, not the most people who are out there saying, eh, I would vote for you, but the most actual people who cast ballots. There are three basic boxes of uh, any campaign operation. And the org chart for a campaign is relatively, you know, uh, divided up into these three boxes. There might be some overlap, some people might do uh, more than, play more than one role, but these three boxes, which I've put actually in boxes here, in squares, uh, are fundraising, organization, and communications. Every campaign that is well run and well organized has these three boxes, these three uh, units of the organization. And they have, uh, obviously they're all pulling together to get to the most votes, but they have very different functions. So, and uh, I want to talk today about what those functions are in general, some specifics about what goes on in each of these, and then how they relate to each other and tie together, which is all the, this is my arrows, uh, moving things, hand gesture. And so, you know, since I can't pace, I'm gonna do a little pacing right here, just to give myself a, a feeling of a normal classroom. It's just not far enough. It's like my cage got smaller, and uh, I'm a big cat, 
and I'm, I, have a, I have a smaller cage now. Yeah, I'm not a big cat. I'm a big, I'm a big human. I need a lot of space, but I don't have a lot of space. So I'm going to do more hand gestures, I think. Anyway, <laughs> enough, enough about me. And it's weird enough that I'm talking to you guys through a camera, honestly, and trying to imagine what a classroom would be like, and then these digressions of mine just become even more wacky. Enough. Fundraising belongs over here on the left because... One, it is actually the first thing that needs to be set up and, and, and going. Without fundraising, you don't have any of the rest of this stuff. You might actually have some volunteers, um, and you might actually have some ideas for, uh, for your issues or your stories, and so you have elements of what's going to go into these other two boxes, and you might even have some people, but you don't actually have these boxes until you've done some fundraising. This also belongs sort of over here on the left, too, because it is, in fact, as I'm sure is not surprising to anybody, the money is the driving force of the campaign. Um, money doesn't win elections in America. Sometimes the candidate who is way underfunded wins. Sometimes the candidate who has tons of money wins. Uh, and obviously, you want more money, and we'll see as I talk about what money does in the campaign. You obviously want more money than less money, and more money allows you to do more things, but uh, money fundraising does not translate into victory. If it did, this would be a way simpler diagram. It would be fundraising box, straight arrow, winning, right? Money is energy, it's resources, it's power that fuels, or excuse me, it's fuel that powers the rest of your organization. And then obviously fundraising also itself, like these other two boxes, it not only provides that fuel, it actually eats fuel as well. Um, just like an oil well, right? Like an oil well, which pulls oil out of the ground uh, to, to uh, generate energy for automobiles and trucks and factories, etc. An oil well itself needs to use a certain amount of energy. So some of the energy, and actually I should you know, have uh, an arrow, and I'm actually, I won't add it, but uh, I'm looking at my chalk, and where can I get my chalk? Uh, there is an arrow here where some of the money needs to go back into fundraising. But, but fundraising is prior in terms of the chronology of a campaign, and then it's also over here on the left always pushing fuel into the rest of the system. Um, there are a variety of ways to raise money, and uh, at, especially in a smaller campaign. Let's say, let's say we're talking about a state legislative race where you're looking at a constituency in Oregon of around 50,000 people. You're looking at potentially somewhere between 10 and 30,000 voters, depending on uh, what the voter turnout rate in that particular district happens to be. Um, so you're looking at, let's just say on average, 20,000 voters and you need to get 10,001 uh, of those voters. Or potentially you need to get 8,000 if there's a three-person race. But to get the most votes in most races, you're going to need to actually get 50% plus one. So you got 10,000 people you need to reach. Obviously, the amount of money it takes to do that is way less than if you're running for, say, city council of Portland, which is actually a lower level of government. It's local instead of state, but it has a larger constituency. Uh, because we have an at-large election system in Portland, if you're running for city council, you're, you have a constituency of roughly 600,000 people, and you have uh, voters, probably around uh, 200,000 voters, and so you're trying to, you're trying to get 100,000 votes. That, that's going to take, that's 10 times more voters uh, that you need to reach to get on your side, and actually in terms of fundraising, the, it's usually exponential growth. When you go from trying to reach 10,000 people to reaching 100,000 people, uh, that's not just 10 times uh, uh, harder, that's not just 10 times more money, it's usually more on the factor of 100 times more money. So as your uh, number of votes that you need to get gets larger, this operation has to scale up exponentially. Uh, <clears throat> but for you know somebody running for state legislature, it's actually it's you know one of sixty people in Oregon who decides what the laws are. There's sixty members of the House and thirty members of the Senate. For those ninety uh, candidates, they're only needing to reach 10, 15, maybe you know maybe fifteen thousand voters to win that particular election. The s different kinds of fundraising will depend on scale, but they're all basically the same, right? The first thing is your social network. In order to even know that you're going to be able to raise money to start your operation, mo the, 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 this is, there's, there's some difference, and we're going to hear from some fundraisers uh, um, and people who are involved with campaigns throughout this course as guest lecturers, uh, that this is not absolutely necessary, but kind of the conventional wisdom is that you have to be able to reach out to a network of people, and that includes family, friends, uh, colleagues and co-workers, people that you've met in the community 
whoever's in your phone, right? Your contact list in your phone, uh, either actual phone numbers or email addresses or people that you could actually go and talk to in, uh, in person, that's your social network. The conventional wisdom is that if you don't have 100 people who can donate money to you, uh, then, and who will donate money to you, who believe enough in you to give you even just $50 or $100, uh, that you really can't get started. That is largely true, right? Uh, the exception is that if you're able to use, uh, leverage your social media presence to get small dollar donors, uh, or if you have a connection to certain very adept fundraisers who are bundlers, and I'll talk about what they are in, in just a second, you can bypass the, uh, the social uh, network sort of startup. But in general, and it would be very helpful, even if you have access to a, uh, a sort of social media network, people that you are connected to who aren't necessarily in your immediate social network, right? Like if you have 5,000 followers on your uh, blog or on your uh, Twitter feed or your Instagram account, that's part of your small dollar donor potential network. Your social network are actually people that you can call right up and say, hey, I'm running for state legislature, uh, I want to raise some money so I can rent an office and hire a campaign manager and start getting some Facebook ads out there to get traction, um, will you give me a hundred bucks? Uh, the idea here, the larger the office, the more voters you have to reach, uh, you know, if you're trying to scale to 100,000 voters, if you're running for city council, you really need this startup money. And this will be a barrier to entry for a lot of people. Um, and there are some people who actually say that shouldn't be a barrier to entry and I'm going to kick the conventional wisdom out the door and say I don't have a hundred people that can each give me a hundred dollars to start my campaign and seed money for my campaign. So I'm, I'm going to run anyway because I actually have the ability to get small dollar donors uh, or I can run a scrappy campaign on a shoelace. More and more people are doing that and I definitely don't want to, one, either say they can't succeed or two, uh, um, uh, say that they you know, shouldn't, that this should be a barrier to entry. But in general, start off, that's, this is your seed money. Small dollar donors are often for a race, you know, if you're, if you're running for state legislature, you can live on this. You know, you don't need a ton of money to run a state legislative campaign. You need more than, uh, usually more than your social network uh, will give you up front. But you can raise money through small dollar donors. And uh, how do you do that? Well, this connects up with social media. And I'll talk about this down here in the communications. So this is where the fundraising and the communications uh, 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 boxes actually have to collaborate. And that's one of the things that you'll see as we go through this entire course is that a campaign really is a co-creation. It's a collaboration, right? Uh, notice that I don't have a candidate up here. And uh, the candidate is actually not even involved yet, right? I mean, they're involved because probably the candidate is actually putting all this stuff together, but that's a, basically the candidate operating as sort of the first campaign manager so that they can then later on hand it off to a professional campaign manager. But the candidate is not even really a relevant factor in the moving parts of a campaign operation, not at this particular point. That might sound really odd because it's the candidate who's seeking the most votes and that's our entire goal. But we don't need to think about the candidate quite yet. We need to think about these different boxes. Um, bundlers are people who will go out and get a set of donations and bring them in. Essentially, these are, I, I hesitate to call them professional fundraisers because they don't need to be professional. They can be amateur. But these are people who uh, want you to win either because they're your father or your mother-in-law or your, uh, you know, your super engaged uh, uh, uncle or whoever it happens to be or a coworker of yours or a person who just like, who's the one who convinced you to run in the first place, who really believes in you, uh, they might have their social network that isn't your social network. And what they can go out and do is they can go out and they can get relatively modest sized donations from a number of people and they will bring those checks bundled and the term bundler comes from back when like they would literally take the checks and bundle them with a, um, a, a rubber band and hand them into the campaign treasurer and say here's here's money um, the this is this is a strategy that's used at every level right presidential candidates have bundlers uh, George W Bush actually raised a ton of money early in his uh, campaign solely with bundlers. I mean, he had, I shouldn't say solely because that makes it seem like he didn't do other things, but largely with bundlers. Um, you may or may not have access to people who can go do that. And if you do, great. 
If you don't, it would be great to be able to make those connections as you go along, right? I, I, just because this is over here on the left doesn't mean that, th that if you don't start off with people who are capable of bundling, that you're never going to be able to rope them in. As you do more and more things, as you reach more people, um, as you uh, uh, develop your campaign uh, into a sort of living, breathing entity that moves forward in this fully fledged uh, machine, these people could come in. It's actually, it's a great thing uh, if you know, you're halfway through your campaign and you're limping along on fundraising and somebody who has a lot of connections, you know, like somebody who worked at Nike and is retired and knows everybody in the executive uh, suites at Nike who believes in you. It's like, hey, you're, you're amazing. I really think you ought to be on the city council. Um, and I know a lot of people who could give uh, $100 checks or $500 checks uh, to your campaign. And I'm gonna go out and contact those. So keeping this in mind for the future is always an important thing. And this reminds me, one of the things about politics in general. Politics is a, is a human system. It's about human connections. Everybody I talk to who's in politics in any way, whether they're an elected official, a strategist, an activist, uh, um, uh, anybody who is involved in politics, lobbyists, staffers, they all say, that relationships are one of the most important, if not the most important uh, uh, factor in success in the political world. And success doesn't mean winning all the time. Success just means even actually having a chance to get a partial win. Uh, relationships uh, are essential and building and maintaining and, uh, and strengthening and then building new uh, relationships is really central to uh, life in politics and absolutely in a campaign. So you start with your social network where you already have your relationships. Uh, you potentially use your uh, social media presence, which is about your virtual relationships. Uh, and then bundlers are people who actually uh, have, a, have a tight relationship with you, who have relationships with other people that you're not necessarily connected with. Um, really, the only way to get outside of uh, that sort of uh, widening circle of relationships, or that widening interlocked uh, set of uh, circles, is with events. Um, events uh, are, you know, where you hold a $100 plate or a $1,000 plate uh, um, dinner, you have speakers, uh, and now this, there is really also, there's relationships here because how do you get people to those events? Who's going to come to those events? Um, these are going to be uh, people who know people who know you. Though there's also ways to get outreach, and we'll I'll talk about that in a minute because you can see that the word events is over here under organization and ground game. So again, we have a connection here, right? Small dollar donors are connected to our social media, which is uh, part of our communications operation. Uh, fundraising events are connected to events here in our organization. So we already have two connections. And for those of you who are familiar with my diagrams, you, you're, you're probably getting triggered like, he's going to draw an arrow here and it's going to mess up the whole thing. I'm thoroughly committed today to keeping this diagram, which I labored over for half an hour before I started the videotape, uh, as pristine as possible. Um, okay, so that's fundraising, and it's, uh, it's a startup activity, and then it's an ongoing activity. One of the things about a campaign as it moves forward towards Election Day is fundraising recedes in it as a central activity. It doesn't ever really go away, though I guess that, you know, I mean, it does at a certain point, like the day before the election, you don't necessarily need to be uh, trying to, to, to raise money, unless what you've done is you've paid for a bunch of ads, and you're in debt and you need to, you need to make up that money and that's, that's a reality as well. What does this money buy you, right? What is this money necessary for? Uh, of course, the common view of what money in a campaign does is that it pays for advertising. And that is actually one of the things it does, right? It pays for the production and ad costs of your communications. Definitely, right? And here's where more rather than less money uh, matters. You can produce a decent Facebook ad on not much money at all. In fact, you can produce it for practically free, given that this thing right here, I'm pointing at my phone, you can, you, it looks like I'm pointing at you, but I, in my view, I'm pointing at my phone. I could make a campaign ad right now uh, based on the very common resources that I have, but it wouldn't necessarily be a really good one. Right? Let's say that I'm running for city council and I set up my phone in my dining room and I say, I'm Jack Miller and I'm running for Portland City Council and blah, 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 all the things I'm going to say, which I, one of the things, of course, you should know, I will not be a candidate. I can play a lot of the roles here in the campaign, but candidate is definitely not a role that I would ever play. For those of you who know me, you don't need to be convinced. For those of you who don't, I, you'll probably see going along throughout the term uh, why it is that I would probably not be a very good candidate as, as a face. But, 
uh, I can produce an ad, but if I have a thousand dollars, then I can pay a videographer five hundred dollars to produce a really good looking ad, um, and I can pay another five hundred dollars to uh, you know somebody who writes a good script for me, or a couple hundred dollars to somebody who's going to do a little bit of focus grouping on the messaging. More money is going to make my production going to be that much better. And then obviously, advertising is necessary, right? I can make a Facebook ad myself, but then I have to pay for uh, it to go on Facebook. Um, I, can make, I can even make a television commercial myself with the phone. I mean, the, the, the high definition uh, video capacity on this phone is good enough to make a television ad. And with uh, Adobe Premiere, I could cut an ad, but I still then would need to put money into, into that uh, to, to getting that advertisement aired. The more you advertise, the more people you reach, the more your message gets repeated, and the more your message is repeated, the more familiar and convincing it becomes to your persuadable voters. So obviously, and this is, this is where I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't already know, which is that money contributes to victory. And this is kind of the most direct kind. But money does a lot of other things uh, in a campaign that are actually you know, just as important, and in some cases even more important. Right? If, we're looking back to what I was saying earlier about who these people are and what the mixture is. If we're looking at a turnout election, if we're looking at you need to get your people to the polls and there aren't a ton of per persuadable voters, or you don't really need to persuade a lot of people, if you have, uh, if you can actually get, there's a, you know, you have enough people that if you get all of the ones there to the polls, you don't need to convince anybody else. If that's the kind of election you're in, then advertising money doesn't really do you much good. And in fact, it's going to be one of the reasons why it's good to know what balance you're going to be uh, um, using here is you don't want to just throw a bunch of money into advertising and you don't want to spend a bunch of time and resources which is uh, you know energy and other money raising a ton of money to advertise if you don't actually need to persuade a whole lot of voters so while I've said already and I'll say it again and probably numerous times uh, throughout the term more money is obviously better than less money that doesn't mean that more time spent raising that more money is always going to pay off. At a certain point, time and energy and money that you, that you roll back into this endeavor is to, to produce more, to, to go here, is, is wasted. And one of the things about a campaign is you have a number of resources that are going for you. Money is obviously an important resource, but you have two other really crucial resources, uh, energy and time. And time is, in fact, not a renewable or expandable resource. Uh, however many days between when you decide to run and when the election is, it's that many days times 24 hours minus the amount of time that you have to sleep. Now, obviously, the more people that you can either employ or get as volunteers in your campaign, that will add 24 hours, well, you know, call it eight hours a day to your store of time. But let's say you have, you know, a thousand labor hours worth of uh, uh, time at your disposal right at this moment. You don't necessarily want to be spending 500 of those labor hours raising money so that you can advertise if the persuadable voters is a very small group or if you've already advertised a lot and you've already probably won over and convinced the persuadable voters uh, that you're going to be able to persuade. And really what you'd be better off doing is spending a ton of that, uh, those labor hours on your ground game, making sure your turnout uh, uh, is good. Now. I'm not going to talk about the campaign manager today, except to note that one of the jobs of the campaign manager, and I'm going to talk about the campaign manager next week, I'm going to do a lecture on it on, for Monday, and then we're going to have a guest lecture from a very experienced and very uh, successful campaign manager, Rebecca Tweed, um, and, she, and she, we're, she's going to talk about, from her professional experience, the stuff I'm going to talk about from my observational experience uh, on Monday, which is what does the campaign manager do, what kinds of skills they have to have, what kinds of decisions do they make, what kinds of dynamics do they control. One of them is the, the campaign manager is in charge of managing the resources of the campaign. Right? Okay, we are super short on cash. We really need money to produce new ads. We're going to have to put some resources into fundraising. Or we're good. Like We don't have a ton of cash, but we don't need a ton of cash. What we're doing right now is we're trying to knock doors to get our, uh, uh, our campaign, get our turnout uh, to be uh, really as high as possible, and we're going to win that way. Then let's not spend money. Let's 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 not let uh, you know uh, Sarah and Chad go you know work in the phone banks to try to raise money. Let's get Sarah and Chad out there knocking doors. Sorry if anybody Sarah and Chad. I don't know where those names come from. It's it's that's just probably 
uh, I don't know, racist, sexist, sex, there's some kind of, there's, there's definitely prejudices involved in those names. So uh, just substitute whatever culturally sensitive and appropriate names belong in those particular places. Anyway, the point is, is part of what a campaign has to do, and this is the campaign manager's job, and it's also, you know, the smaller the race, the less money in the candidate's job as well, is to manage where all those resources go. So that's what most people think money goes for, and it is absolutely very important. Money also goes for field operations, which includes rent on a campaign uh, headquarters or a campaign operation, and rent is, a, is too specific. It includes also phone lines and renting uh, uh, equipment like cell phones uh, that, to have, uh, uh, that can make calls and that also have apps on them that allow uh, your door knockers to track where they're going and all of that stuff. Um, and then management, people who are going to be in charge of the organization. One person is your campaign manager. Uh, another person may be uh, your treasurer uh, in terms of getting paid. There are, especially at smaller races, there are an awful lot of these jobs that will be filled by people who are volunteers. Uh, and it's, it's not uncommon, for example, for the uh, partner of the candidate to, to function as the treasurer of the campaign. Um, but it also is helpful to have somebody who is good with money who you pay, right? And if you're, for example, if your partner is good with money and uh, they have to do less uh, work at their regular day job in order to be the campaign treasurer, it makes sense to pay that person, even though it's your partner, to pay that person uh, something for their time and the important role that they're playing in the campaign. And it's absolutely essential to have at least one professional manager. It doesn't have to be somebody operating at a super high level. It doesn't have to be somebody who's making $150,000 uh, for a campaign or more than that. But to have somebody who knows what they're doing, uh, running the organization. And those people shouldn't come for free. Uh, if they did come for free, then I, then I think that they're, you know, they're throwing it away unless they're independently wealthy. Uh, and they're just like, well, I'm going to help out campaigns. Um, so money goes into your organization. And clearly, if you're just going to have a phone bank, if you're going to get people calling, dialing for dollars for one thing, dialing for uh, voter turnout for another thing, then you need a place for them to be. Uh, or if they're going to be at home, you need phones for them, or you need something, right? Uh, <clears throat> the biggest thing that you need money for, in my opinion, is the paid professionals who are going to do this thing, which is at the heart of the campaign, here it's the heart of the diagram, it's also at the heart of the campaign, and that's your analysis and your strategy. Uh, and I'm gonna talk an awful lot about that today for the rest of the class, and I actually have a breakout up here, uh, but it connects to, obviously you see arrows pointing in both of these ways, but this is, this is really where a campaign's success and failure is made. Um, and the main reason why you need money, especially up front, is because the earlier you can get your paid professionals to develop the analysis of what the race looks like, what the electorate looks like, and what strategy is going to be uh, a smart one going forward, um, the earlier you can do that, the, the better the professionals that you can hire, the higher quality of the information and the ideas and experience that they have, the more likely you are to be successful. So this is, here's the, the you know, this is winning most votes. This is really, I should put a little, I should have drawn this as a heart. Uh, I didn't, I drew it as an oval, but imagine it as a heart, with red chalk. This is the heart of a, of, of a campaign. And this is where you really need money. The money you raise for advertising is useless and actually could be potentially damaging if you don't actually have uh, a good strategy for what you're spending your advertising on, right? If you don't know what issues you should be talking about and what, you, what issues you should be downplaying, uh, if you don't know what kind of story to tell, how to tell it, and uh, in what, what feature of your story as a person is going to reach people, both these folks and these folks, then you could shovel a ton of money into paid advertising and it's going to be uh, utterly useless money because it's not going to reach the people it needs to reach or it's going to reach them in a way that doesn't move them. Uh, you can easily waste a ton of money on production and advertising. Um, that does not translate into the thing you need, which is this, right? You know, you run for city council. Let's say I have a million dollars to spend on my race, and I spend $900,000 of it on advertising, social media and uh, paid media, television, radio, print ads, in uh, the Willamette Week, in the Mercury, in the Oregonian, all that stuff, $900,000. 
if I'm not telling the right story, if I'm not emphasizing the issues that actually people care about, if I'm actually just, in fact, possibly making myself look worse, then my opponent could spend a tiny fraction of that $900,000 and, and win. Uh, or not do any of that stuff at all and just watch as I actually unpersuade voters and de-energize uh, uh, my followers or fail to activate and energize my followers. So this is really what you need. Um, now, what do these paid pros do? Well, I'm going to uh, break it out here in just a second, but there's they, th what their analysis and strategy do is feeds into both of these other boxes. Right? Um, the big question for our turnout is, where are our people? Where are they? And when I say where, I don't just mean physically where, though that is definitely one of the things, for sure. Where are these people? Where should we be going to knock doors? Which, uh, which census tracts? Which zip codes? Which neighborhoods? Um, which parts of our, uh, of, of our district are the people that uh, may or may not even know that I'm running or may or may not know that there is an election or are either potentially, uh, you know, like, eh, they're, they're going to vote for governor and president, but they might not vote down ballot. Where are these people physically so we can go reach them? And where physically for their doors and where physically for their phones and also then where in terms of email, uh, um, and uh, potentially uh, text numbers. So you're, you're going to need people who are going to be able to find where your people are. Also where they are in terms of essentially the issues and their attitude where, like, uh, you know, are these people in a space where they care about the economy? Or are these people in a space where they care about healthcare? Or are these people in a space where they care about national security? Or are these people in a space where they care about uh, education, they care about parks, right? Where are the people who are going to vote for me as long as they know who I am, either because they know, you know, Jack Miller is a person that I trust and he seems smart and reliable, or uh, Jack Miller's a Democrat and I'm a Democrat and I'm going to vote for a Democrat. Um, where are these people sort of both physically as well as uh, mentally? What matters to them? Um, if really the world is going okay for a lot of these people and they're not worried, I mean, <laughs> it sounds here in the middle of a pandemic and an onset of a recession, it seems kind of, uh, I think, odd to even say somebody's not worried. But in a different time and at some point in the future, there could be peace, health, and prosperity happening. And people are like, yeah, you know, I'm not, just not that interested. Well, where are these people so that you can actually go and say, hey, it's important to go to vote. Because if, if we don't get most, the most votes, and your vote is really an important one of those votes, then we might not win and we could get a bad outcome. Where are they physically, but then also, where are they that you can actually reach them and energize them? Because turnout is really all about activating energy, right? You're trying to turn money and effort and messaging into turnout energy, activating people who are, who are with you and getting them to actually not just say, sure, I'll vote for him, but to actually then go and vote. Now in Oregon, it is actually way simpler to do that because people just need to wait for their ballot to come, fill it in, and either put it in their mailbox or just drop it in, 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 a, in a drop box at any time uh, you know, for several weeks. In other states, we actually have to get people to go to a polling place on election day sometime between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. or whatever the hours happen to be. That's, that requires even more energy. But even in a state like Oregon, where it's relatively low energy input to actually do the the physical act of voting, um, the uh, the uh, people, you know, it's still it's still not nothing. The people need to be activated and energized to even remember it. Right there's the ballot on your coffee table, and you see it, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Unless you have a sense of urgency and a sense of importance of that vote, you could maybe just forget to vote. It ha it happens all the time. Um, so the pros need to tell us where are our people, and there are two really big features of uh, the world that give us this information, right? Where are people? There are demographics that, demographic information that's available, right? And then there are voter databases. And some of these voter databases are held by private companies, private researchers who sell them. Some of them are held by political parties. Uh, and in fact, um, if you're running in a partisan race and uh, you happen to be in the party that has a superior voter database to the other party, then you're gonna be at a big advantage uh, in 
this side of things. It may not give you an advantage in swaying and persuading, though it does also because you have a good idea of who the, who the persuadable voters are and, and where they are at least, if not how to reach them. But a superior voter database is going to give you an advantage. One of the reasons why the Democratic Party does so well in Oregon is because we have a you know, progressive left-leaning population, but there are plenty of people who are moderates, and there are plenty of people who are uh, conservative and right-leaning. Uh, the Democratic Party has an extraordinarily uh, uh, powerful voter database, much better, at least this is what I'm told, like I don't know, I haven't seen them vote, but uh, this is the, sort of the word on the street, that it's much better than the Republicans voter database in Oregon. Um, the Republican National Committee, by sort of all reports, has a superior voter database to the Democratic National Committee, and that was actually one of the things that was instrumental in the you know, narrow electoral college uh, route that Donald Trump took in 2016, and it's one of the things that the uh, Trump re-election campaign is really hoping to capitalize on again is a lot of really good information. And it's not just, you know, it's not just who are Republicans and who are Democrats and where do they live, it's what's the strength, uh, what are the issues that matter to you, where do you, where do you live, it's a whole sort of essentially profile. It's really, the voter database is really about, it's about profiling. Uh, companies use these kinds of things, companies have marketing databases. It's the exact same thing as a marketing database. If you have information about the consumption behavior of people in a particular metropolitan area, it is way easier to market your products to them and to sell and make uh, more profits. Um, what companies do with their marketing databases are what pol uh, political operatives do with their voter databases. Um, again, money can help because some of these databases are held by parties and some of them are held by private companies who develop these models so that they can sell them, right? So there, there's both a party uh, effort to develop a voter database and there are private efforts to develop uh, these voter databases. So where are people? Uh, crucial to knowing. Uh, and one of the things that's happening more and more is that um, apps are being used to add information. So you have people who go knock doors, or you have your door knockers, and they have a cell phone, it has, a, it has an app, and when they go to a house, and they have an interaction, they're able to record various facts about that. Like, you know, is that person, are you a registered Democrat? Do you lean Democrat? You know, it asks certain questions. After they walk out of the door, they type the information in the voter database. It has a map, uh, and so it knows exactly what the address is. This is one of the ways in which uh, um, uh, modern technology is being leveraged to improve this stuff. And voter databases have, over the last decade, just gotten to be pretty stellar. Doesn't mean they're available to everybody. You know, if you're running in a nonpartisan race, in Oregon, or in Portland, if you're running for city council, um, you might not have the benefit of the Democratic Party's voter database if you have enough money to pay a private strategist who has their own model and their own information, then that's going to be beneficial. Again, money here not buying advertising, but buying expertise. Um, the uh, other thing is that paid professionals will give you a strategy to speak most effectively to the swayable and persuadable voters. And there's two sides to this, actually. What messages? One, what message energizes supporters? So that's actually messaging going in this direction. Um, what kinds of things are going to get people excited about you? What kinds of things are going to get people to actually go further down the ballot from, you know, president, governor, ballot measures, and then, oh, okay, here, oh, to, to go all that way. What speaks to them? What reminds them of you? What energizes them in that way? What gets them to fill out their ballot in the first place? Uh, then, of course, what messages speak to persuadable voters? Uh, one of the interesting things about persuadable voters is that they tend to be a much more moving target than almost anybody else. The issues that matter to them will really vary from uh, election to election, and that's one of the reasons why they're persuadable voters. It's one of the reasons why they're independents and unaligned is because they make their voting decisions not based on some kind of party identity, some kind of ideology, some kind of particularly strong uh, directional political leaning, but on a case-by-case -case basis, on a candidate-by-candidate, issue-by-issue basis. Uh, this election, we have an election coming up in, uh, in May in uh, Oregon. We have primary elections, and some of our elections uh, that are primary elections are actually not just the classic primary where the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are picking their nominees, um, but uh, primary elections here, often if you get 50% plus one, you win the election. It's, it, there is no general election. There's an awful lot of those. What matters to people right now? Obviously, 
uh, the coronavirus and the economy matter a lot to people. And so it doesn't take a paid professional to know that, but what it does take is it takes uh, uh, paid professionals to know how you, your candidate, given their issues and their background and their activities and their skills, how they can speak to people most effectively about the issues that matter a lot to them. In other elections, when it's just not as obviously clear what the issues are, part of what the, the analysis tells you is, what matters to people? What matters to people right now? Um, usually the economy matters to people either top or very close to the top, but does the economy matter more than national security? Does the economy matter more than healthcare, education, the environment, parks, uh, roads, whatever it happens to be, and depending on what your, uh, what your uh, race is, what you're, you know, if you're running for state legislature, it's going to be a different set of issues than uh, um, the issues that local and national candidates are going to be speaking to. So you need to know what your issues are and how to tell that story. Now, how do you, how do, you do that? A combination of polling and focus groups. Uh, and I will talk about a lot more about polling and focus groups uh, in a subsequent week. And uh, we, we have, uh, there's actually one of your assigned uh, podcast episodes is from a pollster who talks about uh, polling, and I'll definitely get into focus groups, and we're going to hear from people who, who produce and use this kind of data. So we're going to deepen uh, that discussion. Um, what are the aspects of, of uh, communications that these people feed into? I call this the passing game because it really does mostly go out over the airwaves. And in, the great thing about this, the great thing about the air game, is you have total control over it, right? Um, <clears throat> and unlike, say, events where you have to appear, uh, where you're, you don't have total control over your candidate because you don't know what's going to happen in that moment. Candidates are human beings, and however well prepped or trained they are, however personally disciplined they are, you don't really know. If you're shooting an ad and your candidate gets pissed and starts yelling and cursing, you just cut that stuff, right? But you still need to know what to say. So the, the air game, the passing game is very, uh, it's totally in your control, but you still need to know what it is you're controlling. There's two sides to uh, the passing game. Traditional media, which of course at one point that's all there was, and now social media. And in traditional media there's uh, paid, uh, excuse me, the traditional media forms are TV, radio, and print, and there's paid versus free. Free advertising is of course when you get covered uh, by journalists or uh, some, any kind of media, if, you know, if a blogger writes about you, or if there's a, uh, a profile of uh, you on a radio station, or if a television station covers one of your rallies or one of your campaign events, that's free, that's free media. Um, and what you need to know is how to get good free media, right? Pay, paid advertising is, you know, you still need your pros to tell you, okay, what should your ads look like? What should your time slot be? What, should you go mostly radio? Should you go TV? Which TV stations? Uh, uh, are going to reach the kind of people that you're trying to reach, but it's th there's really paid media is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's how do you get good free media? It requires a high level of expertise and creating opportunities for the media to expose you to persuadable voters and to expose you in a way that you have the most control over. Because with free media, much like events, you don't have 100% of control over it, but uh, you certainly don't have control over the words that, that somebody writes in an article or what an announcer says into their microphone when they're covering your campaign event. But you can get, you can influence uh, through a sort of expert uh, management of free media. Social media, of course, is both your own sites, your Twitter feed, your Instagram, your Facebook page, whatever other forms, the, 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 uh, the website, if you have an email list, the newsletter that you send out, these are all parts of your social media. Even though sites is kind of a, I would say, a, a dated term because it means a lot of things. It could mean apps, it could mean newsletters. But it's things that you control and produce through your own channels. Ads are, of course, when you buy presence on somebody else's social media, when you buy a Facebook ad, when you uh, uh, buy a sponsored uh, Instagram post, when, uh, and actually I don't know about Twitter because I'm not on Twitter, you must be able to do something on Twitter to, to, to create ads. Um, putting ads up on uh, you know, YouTube uh, videos, etc. Where do you put them? Uh, you know, Facebook ad, you can buy a Facebook ad and you can spend 500 bucks on a Facebook ad and it's just, if it just goes to people who are 18 to 75 in your area, then maybe that's gonna be doing something good for you, but it would be great if you knew that you, what you're doing is my persuadable voters 
who really are going to go to the polls are people ages 30 to 45 who have a certain set of interests and so you can target certain uh, Facebook sites with your ad a little bit more specifically. So that's what your communications people do. And we're, again, in the course, we're going we're gonna to look a lot at this. I will say, this is the sexy side of, uh, of campaigns. It's the passing game. It's the sexy side of football. right? It's so much more fun to watch somebody throw a 65-yard touchdown pass than it is to watch somebody, you know, uh, a team, do four-yard four runs uh, between the tackles. They get a first down, and you keep doing that, you get touchdowns, but it's way more fun to watch <laughs> Russell Wilson throw a 65-yard touchdown pass, and the guy's toes are in the corner of the end zone, and he it falls. It's, it, this side of campaign is, you know, it, it feels like this is where all the money goes, and this is the sexy side, and this is what wins elections. It may be what wins elections, but it actually it may be a waste of time, uh, and it may be that... If you, put, you lose, if you put more energy into your turnout side of your operation, the way less sexy side, the ground game, you would have won with persuading nobody or persuading a small group of people. Uh, but obviously, this is going to be done. And communications, I have it on the diagram that it only points at the swayable or persuadable voters. That's not true. As I point out up here, we need messages to energize our supporters as well. So I really ought to have an arrow, and I will do it. I'm going to go get a piece of chalk. And I'm going to add that our communications are also an important part of generating turnout. What's going to speak to our people to energize them? I'm going to write energize. See, so far, actually, I'm very happy to have had the diagram up here because even just doing that and turning my back to the camera and look how horribly written that is, it's so much nicer to actually have it. So I think that the experiment with pre-diagramming is going to continue until I tire of it, probably. Uh, anyway, our communications effort is aimed at persuadable voters, but also at energizing turnout. <clears throat> the organization ground game, this is the thoroughly unsexy part, and this is the part that wins many elections, and a lot of people who've been in campaigns for a long time will tell you that this is the most important part, especially at the local and state level, knocking doors, making phone calls, building coalitions, getting endorsements. Uh, essentially, you know, the four-yard runs between the tackles that get you close to that first down. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of time and energy. It's actually very, usually very inexpensive because a lot of the people doing this stuff are going to be volunteers. It's, of course, helpful to have uh, paid people to either uh, make sure you have full time or to supplement your volunteers or if you just don't have enough volunteers to, to do all you know, to knock all the doors that you know would help get you a good turnout election then if you have money to pay people to do that um, then uh, that's great it would be great the best thing is to run your organization purely on activist and supporter energy and I say the best thing one because it means you spend less labor hours raising money but Two, it also means that the people who are doing this stuff really believe in you, right? If you're paid to go knock doors uh, for your candidate, there's going to be an enthusiasm gap there, right? And usually, of course, what you're going to do is you're going to have a paid person going with a volunteer uh, so that there's at least one person who's excited there. But obviously, it would be better off that if everybody from your campaign interacting with potential voters has a level of enthusiasm and belief in your candidate, that's going to translate into a lot more energy because what gets us turned out is this is energy. Here it is. Now that I have a piece of chalk in my hand, it's dangerous, so I'm going to put the chalk down. Um, we're going to go through all of these features again. Phone calls, door knocking, holding events, building coalitions, getting endorsements uh, as we move forward uh, in the course. So this is the moving parts of a campaign operation. This is, this is, this is everything. There's nothing hidden. I mean, there's the candidate. I haven't really talked about the candidate. The candidate's kind of behind all this stuff. Uh, but, and there's the campaign manager, and there's the treasurer, and there's the uh, social media director. There's all specific roles. But this is what the organization looks like. There's nothing. I've left nothing out. If you stop watching videos for the rest of the term, you will have learned, I think anyway, a tremendous amount about how to win a political campaign. The rest of the course is going to be dedicating to deepening your understanding and your and strengthening, or I shouldn't say strengthening, building your skill set at uh, achieving uh, all of these particular things, so that at the end of the course, you actually one, as a political analyst, know how campaigns are run and what wins them and what loses them, 
and as a potential campaign manager or as a strategist or as a campaign worker or as a future candidate, you know what it takes to actually make this machine function at a high level of efficiency so that you get the one thing you would need in a campaign. It's just, it's only one, it's one simple goal, the most votes. And it's not even that complicated what, what it takes. It's obviously the issues, the storytelling, what it takes to, to persuade persuadable voters is, is different from election to election. And these paid pros, they'll tell you, they tell me all the time, like there's, you, you, you can't, there's no cookie cutter campaign. There's no way to say, oh yeah, you're running for state legislative district, I know what to do to win that particular election, right? There's a lot of I know what it will take to win this election, but then what, is it, what are the details? That's what gets filled in on the ground, in real time, uh, during the actual campaign. All right, well that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this first lecture, and I, I feel pretty good about the pre-diagram diagram. All right guys, have a great week. I will see you on, I won't see you, but on Monday, or before Monday, you will see more of me here in my dining room. There will be more days on the self-quarantine count-up. I hope everybody is uh, staying healthy, staying sane, not getting too cabin crazy, and doing great.